everyone. This is David Starr from WatcherPass.com, your website for movie reviews, interviews, and recommendations. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by David Bly and Leah Ruddick, the writers and stars of Sweet Parents. David also took on the role of, of director, so he's, he was juggling three hats and uh, Leah was juggling two. It's a very special film. It's a, it's a very interesting, dramatic, emotional film. Uh, and we're going to talk to them in just a second. But first, let's check out that trailer. And while you're watching, if you could like and subscribe to this channel, that'd be fantastic. It helps me out a lot. Thank you. How I have loved you How I have loved you If you want to experience this city How the way that it's I evolving, have you to have a sugar mama or a sugar dada or something like that, okay? How I'm Gabby. I uh, Gabriella. Everyone calls me Gabby. It's a pleasure to meet you, Gabriella. I would really love to cook dinner. I have loved you. Can hmm. you make a good wish? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, how's it going? Doing well. How are you? Thank you so much for joining me. This is uh this is exciting. I got my uh my chef's apron on to <laughs> in, in honor of the film and I'm hoping to cook up a good interview. So let's uh let's see what happens. Give yourself some oven burns just to have some sympathy pains. Yeah, no, I'm not as good of a chef as uh, as you appear to be in the film, but uh, I do what I can. <laughs> so awesome. Uh, this is David Bly. Is it Lee Ruddick? Leah. 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 Okay. I'll have to fix that. Uh, Leah Ruddick um, of Sweet Parents. They're the writers and stars, and David also directed. So uh, a, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of tasks that they took on for this, this special film. Um, but and I'm really excited to talk about it. Uh, the reviews on the website. I, I love the film. It was a it was a nice surprise in this uh, you know as the winter approaches to, to get this film out there. Um, so I guess the first question is: Sweet Parents an actual term? I, I, it feels like a like a you know gender neutral nicer riff on Sugar Daddy. But I just wasn't sure if I'm just out of it and I don't know what you know the kids talk about these days. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's very big in the UK, I guess. No, no, it's a it's a, a term that we made up for this lifestyle that sort of encapsulates all uh, directions of that kind of arrangement. So, sugar daddy, sugar mama, regardless of orientation, it's just a, it's sort of a catch-all. Yeah, it felt, it felt like a, I was like, oh, that, that does sound much nicer, like much more socially acceptable, gender neutral. It's, it's very, uh, you know, millennial. <laughs> so. <laughs> and, uh, and this film came out, uh, so IMDb says 2017, so I'm not sure if it debuted at a, at a festival out there, but I guess how, how did this film come about? You know, what was the journey to get it to, to finally be digitally released uh, uh, early last month? Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, it's been it's been a long journey. Um, David started working on it, the script ten ten years ago. More, yeah, at this point, over ten years 2006, ago. Two thousand six. And so, then, oh, wow. yeah. Um, and then we met and started collaborating on it together, and um, we shot it five years ago in New York, and then um, we had a festival run with it in twenty seventeen, and finally we're releasing it out into the world yeah. <laughs> it's been, a, it's been a, a much longer road than i think either of us anticipated it would be but we're happy it's out there now yeah no, I'm, I'm happy it is too it's been kind of a, a weird silver lining to this this whole crazy year is you just it seems like you get a lot of independent films coming out uh, coming out digitally so you know everyone can watch them at home and just enjoy them and it kind of i feel like it puts the indie films kind of on an equal playing field because just isn't much competition from the big budget uh, films. So well, I, guess, yeah. I guess the film's been out for a, about a month. You know, have you gotten any reactions or any 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 buzz? Or you're still just kind of seeing how it's doing. Uh, it's been a overwhelming overwhelming response, uh, overwhelmingly positive, also. But just that uh, it's been surreal to. Um, really see that the movie is resonating, that the story is resonating with so many people uh, across different countries and everything, but um, it's it's been really exciting. I think when we had our screenings at the festivals, um, they were such incredible screenings, 
but they were just like essentially one-offs where uh, it's hard to really gauge whether or not this would translate to a broader audience because when you have a, a festival it's really like a very passionate film loving audience which is our favorite type of audience obviously uh, but it doesn't necessarily represent the the greater content absorbing population and so this time around we've gotten some like very special reviews yourself included your review just like made us very happy i mean like I, to full disclosure it was just like we both sat there reading it and just like welling up because it it, it really feels so fulfilling and validating that the intention of the story the the choices that we made that the I, the, the choices we made to subvert uh, typical norms that you one would take with a story like this. We went off the beaten path with it and the fact that it resonated and that it landed, that people understood it and appreciated that choice was so fulfilling. It, it was just like mind blowing. And we just like keep reading the reviews over and over again uh, as we fall asleep and have sweet, sweet dreams. Well, that, that is fantastic. I'm really, really glad to hear that because I, I know this film sounds like it was a, it was a journey for you all. And it's, it's such a, it's such a challenging subject matter, I think, to capture on, on film. I think you guys did such a, a lovely job, you know, threading that needle between comedy and drama and between, you know, kind of relationship norms and, and the need to succeed. It was just such a, such a, I want to say fun story. It wasn't really a fun story. It was, <laughs> it was a, it was, it was a fascinating story, I'll say. <laughs> Uh, how much you like to torture yourself in your own relationships yeah exactly <laughs> uh so so david i guess you know you started and then and then leah came in later what what inspired this i mean were you were you struggling and just trying to you know figure out something to do or or what the, you know where did this story come from um yeah so when i had moved to new york in 2005 2006 i was going there for grad school for acting and uh moved there from montreal from canada and I think for every single person who moves to New York, uh, despite the, except for the small few that have a lot of access as soon as they get there, the majority uh, are just like hit by the realities of the hardship of that city. And it's not just New York, it's like a lot of major metropolitan cities um, or anywhere, just moving anywhere without the, the, the backing. And uh, I felt that hardship uh, like so many others. and. I was working as a bartender in a restaurant and I was acting and I was writing and uh, I met some people that were living this kind of lifestyle and it seemed like such a great, uh, whatever the like cheating thing in uh, Snakes and Ladders where you could just like <laughs> up the board and it's like, oh, that would be such a great uh, lifestyle. I was in a different relationship at the time. Uh, it didn't make sense to do this kind of thing because I didn't think that that's, how I wanted to pursue my craft. Uh, that relationship aside, uh, the people that I knew living this lifestyle sort of like talked me through it, talked to me about it, what they were uh, gaining from it. Um, and I just like asked so many questions. I went to a couple locations around New York that were notorious for this kind of hookup um, just to observe and just got fascinated with the idea and started writing the idea um, casually while I was in school. Um, I think the initial idea was, I, I often call it immature because it didn't really have the, the weight of a real relationship at the, the heart of the story. I think my earlier relationships in my own personal life and also just like my awareness of what I wanted for myself were still not um, mature enough. And then when I met Leah, who we should mention is is an independently wealthy eighty year old Austrian princess who's a uh, you know I guess that you know that, that's where the story comes from. <laughs> yeah, I sought her out. I, I yeah, yep. <laughs> we're, it'd be great if it's like below the screen we're like hooked together. With like, um, There'd be golden handcuffs, of course. So yeah, of course. Right. studded with diamonds. <laughs> um. The, the script at the time, as I was meeting Leah, I, I remember sending it to some friends uh, who were actors and writers, and it was like an older couple. They were in their uh, 40s, and, 40s and 50s, and they read the script, and they were very complimentary, but they said that anyone, if this is the path you're going, where it, the story focuses on the sexual jealousy within this relationship, then no one over 35, 40, what have you, 
will care about this story. It'll feel just like meant for kids. And that's where the immaturity came in of my own understanding of my own relationships. And it just so happened that it coincided with me meeting Leah and falling immediately in love. And now we're together 10 years and it's just a real relationship that I would give everything for. And that's the heart of the story. It's not about the sexual jealousy. It's the, the, the jealousy of self-worth, of wanting to help someone that you care about, just help them achieve all of their goals and dreams and ultimately feeling like you're failing and then someone else can just come in like this and make their life so much better in an instant, what that does to you in your own relationship. And that came with meeting Leah and that's when we started working on it together. And influence the, the, the story got influenced by our own relationship and our own feelings for each other and our own conversations and fights and dreams and everything like that. Just a heads up, in this part of the interview, we get into some spoilers about the film and, and there's some more spoilers kind of throughout the interview. So if you haven't watched it yet, I would definitely check out the movie and then come back and, and finish the interview. Thank you. That is, that is such a fantastic story. And I, I, I really liked your point about how the, originally it was, you know, focused more on the, on the sexual side of it. And I think that that's one of the really great things about this film is that you don't get that. You do kind of see these different, you know, very different relationships kind of develop and they all, you know, they're all relationships in their own right. And they all have different goals and, and, and hopes and dreams and, and cares. And that's, I think that's what really makes this a special film is that, you know, like, like you said, um, you know, Gabby's relationship is not sexual. It's, it is, you know, friendship and, and mentorship and, you know, probably, you know, a little bit of just companionship as well. Sure. Um, and, and it, it's kind of an, a very tough line to draw when, when, when she's with, um, Oscar, but it's, it's, it's also, you know, something that's really special to see. And then, then your own relationship with, uh, Gillian, Gilly, what was yeah. her name? Gillian. Yeah. Um, that was also just another very interesting relationship uh, in the film, a little yeah. maybe more on the physical side, but, uh, but still, you know, still kind of trying to thread that needle. It's funny that after every one of our festival screenings, uh, one of our producers would get up in front of the audience and, uh, do a, a poll take a poll with the audience and just say like, who here thinks that uh, Gabby and Oscar had sex? And you'd have like a, a couple hands here and there. And then who here thinks that Will and Guillen had sex? And it was just like the entire audience just like <laughs> shot out. And it's like, we, we never say it, we never show it, but it's so funny that so many audiences just like immediately go there and then when you start asking people like probing questions it's like well in brazil yeah they they probably and then all of a sudden the the playing field got a bit more level but uh, not everyone is very suspicious of my character understandably so and you know one, another thing i've really kind of it kind of hits you in this film is it starts as, as kind of a comedy right like a kind of a maybe a dark comedy and then it just kind of slides into this you know heavy drama um, was it, was it always kind of written that way or is that just kind of a consequence of maybe the script, you know, developing over five years and with different, uh, with different people working on it? I think it had a lot. I mean, I think it, I think it always had that, um, opening where it was like the, the comedy of finding an apartment in New York, but I think it was definitely added to by the, by the people we cast, which mm. were a lot of like, you know, New York comedians, um, and they definitely brought their own um, comedic voices to it. I feel like we ended up having to cut a lot of um, additional like scenes or like moments from scenes that yeah. we shot that were so funny, but ultimately it didn't serve the larger story, which does turn into like a heavier drama. So we had to try to condense the comedy a little bit, but it's still there. And I think the hook, the, the intention was to hook the audience in somewhat of a, a strange way that emulates what it's like to move to New York where you um, are coming with all this energy and excitement and then it just changes over time. Uh, at least that's what my experience was. I think both of our experience was where, um, and I often describe the film that like, it's not about the couple that just moved to New York that's full of excitement, like concrete jungle, we're gonna just like take this city by storm. It's about the couple that's been there for 10 years or however long and just says like, what the hell are we still doing here if it's not gonna like give us back all this love that we're giving to it. And so it starts off with that 
excitement and just like frenetic uh, apartment hunt and the comedy of that. But then it's just, it slows down a little bit and you really have to sit in the fact of what are we doing here? What, what's happening to us? And why is this sort of feeling like it's out of our control? Yeah, definitely. I, uh, so I used to work in a job where I got to go to New York uh, regularly. Yeah. And I always would say, you know, three to four days, that's the perfect amount of time to be in New York. I love it. It's energetic. It's fun. And yeah. I like to go back to my boring life down, down in DC and, you know, yeah. not, not stay up all night and everything. So <laughs> like Adam, it's, totally it's just, it's very loud. Whenever he would come visit me, my dad would be like, it's great for a couple of days. It's just so loud. Everyone is just talking over each other. And it's like, yeah, it's true. And so it sounds like, you know, from, from the earlier description, this was a net positive, but I guess, you know, what was it like working on a, on a, a deep relationship script with someone that, you know, you were developing a relationship with and, and kind of having some very harsh truths and, you know, emotional scenes, you know, within this script that may or may not be playing out in your real life as well. How, how was that process? And, you know, I assume it was fine because you're still together, but, uh, you know, I'm just curious to hear about that. Ultimately, it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> Blink um, twice if you... <laughs> <laughs> no, um, no, it was, I think it was like high highs and low lows, you know, it was, it was so amazing to be able to collaborate on something so personal and emotional um, and to be able to go on that journey together. And it was also sometimes very hard, you know, it was... The final scene yeah that final scene was it was we were shooting it on one of the last days of sh of our our shoot and we were both exhausted and um you know there there was maybe some off screen fighting that bled into the on screen fighting yeah that's just method acting i think is what it's called yeah yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. that was uh it was challenging i mean also like when you're also wearing multiple hats i feel like the last thing you want to do, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll veer this conversation more towards relationships as away from films for a second, but it's like the last thing you want to do in a relationship fight is come across as uh, telling someone how to do something or how to behave. How to behave. And when you're having a fight like that or a conversation or argument like that, at the same time as directing a scene with your scene partner, it was definitely a a learning experience on the directing side. And this was like my first feature effort as a director. And um, I feel like that was the hardest it could get was learning how to communicate with someone that I cared most about um, to not only find ways to heal in our argument, but at the same time, find ways to make this yield the type of performance that I think the, the scene needed, that I, that I know that she knew the scene needed. Um, and just like for myself as well, that like, how do I put this real emotional stuff aside to bring forth the emotional stuff that's needed for the scene? And is it the same thing? Is it sometimes it's different things and it's just like parsing through that all in real time as there's other production needs going on. And, that was definitely a, a very interesting moment. I think that was like the biggest challenge of the entire production. Yeah, and I think on top of all of it, we were getting kicked out of the space we were in. Yeah. Like we, we had a very yeah, like limited amount of time minutes. in the space. So it was, it was just heightened on all levels. Yeah. Thank you for joining the uh, relationship advice side of this, uh, this interview. Well, that's a, I mean, that is a really interesting point just because, you know, you're, you're dealing with heavy emotions and like you said, you're the director, so you're kind of saying what's happening, but also trying to be cognizant of how that affects both the scene and your, you know, more important relationship as well. And, and that's, yeah. uh, I commend you for taking that on as your, as your first feature directing film. I, uh, you know, I don't know what your next one's going to be, maybe like a film while you're skydiving or something, uh, you know, something less, less stressful. Yeah, yeah. that's a good idea. Yeah, when we talk <laughs> about our in-laws and just... <laughs> Um, and so your relationship was, was really, you know, fun at times, you know, very you know, emotional at times, but it was really kind of interesting also the relationship between the sweet parents. So where did you find, um, the, you know, the, the two actors that played the sweet parents? They were, they were just a lot of fun in, in very different ways, but just a lot of, you know, fun to see on screen as well. Yeah, they're... Yeah, we got really lucky with them. Um, Barbara, who plays Elan, was someone that we cast. Um, we 
sent out a casting call and got tons of tapes and she just she sent us a tape and it was just it just like totally blew us away she's just like it was just like oh this is this is the carry this is the part this is the person yeah um and we ended we we actually got that tape like two years before we shot the film we thought we were going to shoot it earlier than we did but um luckily two years later when we were able to shoot it she was still available yeah um and then casey who plays oscar was was david's teacher yeah he was my teacher in grad school in new york he taught uh i was in grad school for theater and he was a directing teacher and uh acting teacher as well and he's like a, a quite successful actor in the star trek world uh and among other a lot of like films and TVs and stuff. And he was just like a, a big mentor when I was in school. And I remember sending him the script when it was at its like one of its latest stages uh, when I had been working on it with Leah and he loved the script and he was so excited. And he's like, yeah, love it. Let me know when you get the money for it. And a couple of years later when we did get the money, um, he was like fully on board, just as committed as he ever was. and was just like a thrill to work with. And he was also a very valuable asset on set too, as a experienced director, um, especially as a theater director that just helped with figuring out some staging things. Because I think the film, our intention as two people that came from the theater was to have some of it a theatrical nature to the longer scenes, like the final scene, like the climactic dinner scene with the sweet parents, um, for it to feel sort of like a play. Um, to let there be some air in the scene the way a play would feel and he was very valuable to just like give insight into something that how how the the blocking would go how the spacing would go the timing the pacing so he was just like so valuable on so many fronts yeah that's a that's a really interesting point for the final scene i'm going to talk about that in, in a second but yeah that's uh now that you mentioned it, it does it does feel much a lot like a like a play would with, with you know some of the yeah. longer pauses and you know like a one yeah. take style totally yeah. uh so you mentioned a couple times that it, it took a bit to get funding. if you if you don't want to talk about it, that's fine but i was just curious how did you go about getting funding for this this type of film did you, did you have your own sweet parents or <laughs> you know <laughs> sweet parents in, in, in theory <laughs> that part we won't talk about uh, no, uh, um, so we had been lining up to do a crowdfunding campaign uh, and we had shot our video and it was a, a very fun, quirky video and we were really excited to do it and um, just like we had reached out to so many, this is going to be like a, a roundabout answer to get to the final punchline of it, but um, we had reached out to so many restaurants, we had reached out to so many crew people, so many actors over the years and everyone was just sort of like on board to be a part of this production when we officially picked a date. And um, we just never picked that date because we never had the money in hand. And we were setting up to do the crowdfunding. And at the stroke of midnight, there was a bit of a windfall of cash that came in from some family stuff that had like, I don't wanna say paid off, but it was like um, things that had like been just some, some family investments had like helped out a lot. That, what David's uh, saying is he comes from the mafia. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, and, this uh, is a, uh, I, I like this dark uh, sequel where, where you find out the, the mafia connection and the, and the, the rich uncle connection. This, is, this will be an interesting second film. Um, but we did get like some help from family. We had saved up some money as well. And um, there were some like other friends of family that helped out. So it was very like close to us to be able to make this. Um, and we made it for a fraction of what the actual budget was. Um, our producers like put together a budget when we were first in pre-production and we were never gonna be able to make that. We didn't have that much money. We didn't have a lot, but it was just all of a sudden every restaurant that we had reached out to was so kind. Like the, the restaurant where we meet the character Pierce it's this restaurant, Mayahuel, in New York. It's like a tequila bar, Mexican restaurant. And that scene was written with that restaurant in mind. It was one of my favorite places in New York. I actually think that it may have closed down during the uh, pandemic. Um, but we met Justin, the owner of Mayahuel, and 
reached out by email saying like, is it possible? We would love to shoot it here. It's our favorite place. But every time we pass it, it's just like, it sparks us with so much hope to make this movie. He called us in and he's like, whatever you guys need, as many day days as you guys need this place, it's yours. I'll charge you just like a nominal fee, like a cleaning fee. It's like a couple hundred bucks. Um, I just want to like help good people make good things. And it was like the most inspiring thing. And there were so many people throughout the production that were like that, that brought our budget down through these in-kind contributions that we were able to make this film for a fraction of what it needed to be and a fraction of what it looked like um, because of the good graces of so many people. And like when we got that small windfall of cash, windfall sounds like it's a massive number, it's not, but when we got that chunk of cash, we were in New York because Leah had some comedy shows going on in New York because she, she's very prominent in the comedy scene. And, we were in LA at the time. We had already moved away from New York because like, screw it, screw New York. They're never gonna let us make this movie. We're in LA. We go back to New York for a weekend with these carry-on bags that our laptop is currently propped up on top of. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, all the strings. We're telling you all the strings. But um, we were there. We had this small windfall and it's like, you know what? We're just staying to make the movie. And like my brother and his sister, I mean, my sister-in-law, sister convince us to stay, make the movie, reach out to everyone that was initially involved. And in a matter of like two weeks of pre-production and a three week shoot, we just like shot this film. So it was very like in the spur of the moment in the like dark of night that we made this film with not as much money as we needed, but because of the good graces, everything just like magically came together. Yeah. That is, that is such a fantastic story and it's uh crazy to hear that yeah like like the trip in the film it just kind of happened in the middle of the night spur of the moment there yeah. you go That's it's probably not like a emulatable story i wish i could be like this is how you raise this amount of money but it's uh and it's not necessarily going to happen again for us this way but hopefully that stroke of good luck created something special for us that this could then lead to someone uh with actual windfalls just i think I think the only constant from all the indie directors I've talked to is that there is no there is no set path. It's just always it's it's part a lot of luck, a lot you know good you know people skills and just and there was one person I talked to where the the like main star of their film uh, did it for for less than they were asking and then returned the money after saying you you all need it more than I do like use this for marketing or something like that. So you just that's so nice. <laughs> yeah, you just you just never know. It, 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 but it, it's it just seems like such a, a personal, challenging, but also a very fulfilling journey. So I'm glad to hear that everything worked out. Yeah, I think it's just one of those things where you know this idea of deciding to do something and then things just fall into place somehow. Like it was it was really a. a I feel like a great lesson in that, you know, we set a date and we are like, we're just going to do it. And we don't know how, but somehow it, it came together. Yeah. Just the date. yeah. Awesome. Um, so, and you said that this was all filmed in New York. Uh, I'm just curious, the scenes in Brazil, I assume those were in some other part of New York, like outside the city, but you know, did, was that, uh, was where, that where was that? <laughs> Yeah, that it's actually very affordable to go to Brazil and just do it. <laughs> yeah. That part we had shot years before. It was just so easy. Yeah. You know, we, shot, we actually shot that in California. Um, Casey Biggs, uh, who plays Oscar, lives in Paso Robles, which is beautiful wine country in California. And he's, he's famous in Paso Robles as the Paso Robles wine guy. Yeah, you can so. look up his videos. They're very funny. Um, so he, we, we just, you know, <laughs> he took us around. He was friends with all that because he's the Paso Robles wine guy, uh, which is like a play on the Dos Equis guy. Mm -hmm. um, he's friends with like so many vintners in Paso Robles that they, again, were very gracious to like give up their properties for however we needed to shoot something to make it look like lush green of and like a open spaces that is supposed to be what Oscar does for Gabby, just like open her world and create so much opportunity. So we found these like beautiful landscapes um, and old timey looking places to just make it seem charming. And uh, yeah, Paso Robles. I love that Oscar is not a sweet parent, but he is, he's doing a lot of what that would be. I mean, he's opening the doors, he's got the connections, he's, he's believing in you and, and really kind of helping you along. Yeah. I, I love that aspect of it. 
Yeah. Yeah, he was our real life sugar daddy. <laughs> um and the, the film has so many good lines and good scenes one scene that, that kind of hit me is uh you know the, the scene in brazil when oscar is making the steak and and he gives it to gabby and she said this is the best thing i've ever tasted and i was like oh god that that hurts so much to hear her say that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, was that i, I was don't that... think that um i think that i didn't realize that we were doing sound for that scene and i was actually just tasting it it was so it was good. improvised like, it and was, we kept it yeah I, there wasn't supposed to be sound uh in that segment so i was just eating a delicious steak yeah but it it worked perfectly for <laughs> the story because it's it's definitely a huge dagger into uh will's intentions it's like it was the perfect summation of uh what oscar does for her yeah, I expected to see like a cut to Will and just like him having just like a heart attack or fainting or something at that moment. <laughs> uh, moment, yeah. 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 Uh, so, so speaking of the food, um, you know, where did it all come from? I mean, Dave, are you like a are you also just a, a world class chef on top of a director, writer, and actor? Or you know, where did all this this delicious food come from? And and where did you learn to cook? Um, so. When I started writing this film, I wanted Will to be a chef. I felt like that was a, a good role for someone in New York. The, I didn't really want to focus on like actors, like my own personal story. I wanted it to be other people that like worked with their hands. Um, and I essentially taught myself to cook. My brother is an excellent chef. He's the best chef that I've ever tasted. And, um, He's actually in the movie. He has a small cameo in one of the kitchens. We tricked him into like, we cornered him into the kitchen and he was forced to be in the movie. And he sort of helped design the menu for the movie. Uh, and anytime he was on set, he just like zhuzhed up all the food and make it look so pretty. Um, and we had uh, our production designer, Kelsey, and we had a, a food stylist on set as well um, when my brother wasn't there, um, Diana, that just helped um, work on everything on the three stages of presentation of like the raw form the mid prep form and then the final presentation form um and i wish i could have like cooked uh during the film we have like a couple like leah was saying before we had to trim some comedic moments we also had to trim some uh cooking scenes as well which is one of my regrets of the film that we couldn't include more really cool cooking stuff um but just for the sake of time, we just, it didn't help the, the flow. But uh, yeah, I, when I first started writing the movie, I, I essentially taught myself how to cook to be able to look natural in those moments. And now I cook uh, all the time. It's like my, my escape mode. This, this movie sounds like it was, a, it was very good for your relationship. Uh, may, maybe painful at times, but, but overall it works out because that's a fantastic skill, especially now when, when everyone's locked down. So that's yeah. a, exactly. really good, really good prep. Uh, and Leah, where, where do those sculptures come from? Uh, you know, there, there, there are a few prominently featured. Are you also a, an artist uh, on the side as being a comedian, writer, yeah. and actor? Not at all. Um, they, they, David's mom is a sculptor, a real family affair. Um, and she, the, all of those sculptures are hers. Um, and she actually came to New York while we were in production and she, um, she brought all her sculptures and she brought all her tools and she sat down and taught me how to look like I was sculpting, yeah. <laughs> uh, which was amazing. Um, and we gave her a, a brief cameo to thank her as well. Yeah. She's in one of the gallery scenes, um, as the gallery owner. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. I, I love the, the family and, and, and connections aspect of this movie. Yeah. Um, so going to the dinner scene, which is a, a painful, but also beautiful scene, you know, how was that to shoot? I mean, it must have been, been very awkward. Um, and, and I guess how many takes did it take? And I know you wanted to do it as a play. So was it just one continuous take or how did, how did you construct this, uh, this tense affair? <laughs> Uh, we shot it over two days, um, and all the apartment stuff took place in one of our producers. It was her apartment, um, and it belonged to her and her uh, now, oh, her husband, yeah, 
um, who actually plays Alberto, the like owner of the restaurant in the beginning of the film, who was another like talented friend of ours that we were lucky to have in the movie. But so we shot everything in their home. Um, we posted up for a week and kicked them out for a while. And we split that long dinner scene uh, into three sections as it naturally stands with the part where it's just myself and Leah mm -hmm. discussing the dinner, uh, me sort of explaining the plans of the dinner. Um, when everyone arrives pre, pre like come down and then the final like candle scene. Uh, and we, we broke that up into three separate sections because it was just like a bear um, and we didn't get to have like that many takes, I feel like, because it was just like very long days. It's mm -hmm. just, we had so many angles for that. We, we treated that section of the film with so much care and gave it so much time. Mm -hmm. um, but it felt like we could have used another two days to do it. But I think that hectic energy around it added to the tension in the scene. I think like the final thing that we shot was my final monologue that I was just like struggling with as well and wanted like knowing how it was supposed to sound in my head, having like looked at it for years, um, struggled with it a little bit in the performance and then took some time, talked with some like advisors on set, talked with Casey, talked with Leah, talked to one of our producers and just like came through and figured out ways to achieve the performance that was needed. And then um, Lara, our cinematographer, who was like a dream to work with, was just the reason why we chose her to work with her was because she not only was technically proficient, but she was um, invested in the story as well, the, the heart of the story as well. She was experiencing similar things in her own relationship, um, similar struggles. And so she really knew when we had something and where to move around the space. And I think one of the first conversations we ever had was that I wanted this film to feel claustrophobic when we were in their home. Um, that's the reality of like a, a regular New York apartment is that it's not these sweeping uh, lofts or whatever for most people. It's a very like overlapping, like my cooking stuff is falling, spilling out onto her um, sculpting stuff and vice versa. So I said to Lara that like, this movie should feel like a shoes in the shot feel where if your shoes end up like, if she's like hurled in the corner with the camera and her shoes end up in the shot, that's fine. Obviously that was the worst thing that a cinematographer could ever hear. And she's like, I get it. Absolutely not. And I was like, great. I'm just using it as a, a reference point. Uh, but she totally understood it. And that was the, the feel of just like, very close around everybody feeling like there's just this like tension lurking on everyone's shoulders and i think she just like nailed with her team she just like absolutely nailed it mm -hmm. yeah and we had to trust her so much because we were performing which was just like a great uh chemistry that we had built by then yeah. it definitely I, I love those um those articles where it talks about you know the real cost of how of how these you know struggling new york artist apartments would be it's just you know unrealistic yeah. expectations. So I, I love that aspect too, that they, they really did feel like they were on top of each other the entire yeah. time. And uh, so, so Leah, how therapeutic was that slap and how many takes did you, did you have to do to get it exactly right in that scene? A lot, as many as I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, um, we did a, a quite a few actually, yeah. but um, <laughs> it was, Rehearsal too, you know, you have to rehearse it to make sure it's right. And... Yeah. <laughs> Both hands. Different, <laughs> different sides. Yeah, um, close-ups. And... No, I, I felt bad. Um, but, you know. That was the best one by far. That was the, the one that is that made the final cut was the best slap. So I feel like your face may have already been a little red from all the previous. I don't know. There were, yeah, <laughs> there, were, there were two very good slaps. A lot of the others were just not good slaps if i'm being honest they were i didn't Excuse feel it me. i didn't feel it it did, didn't connect in the right place um but then you took her aside and said no this is how you have to do it and then she just built it up and it was perfect and that that felt like a very 
Yeah, that felt like a very real slap when I saw it on the screen. So, in the script, it's like labeled as like it doesn't necessarily sound like a slap of like skin on skin. It sounds like bone hitting bone. It's just like a very like comes from the whole shoulder is how it's written and like on that take it really feels like she nailed the line this the stage description perfectly just excellent acting and excellent directing i imagine yeah. <laughs> um yeah. and and you know the, the music in this film there's not a lot of it but then that that final credit song i must have listened to it like four or five times as i was writing the review just on repeat because it's such a a beautiful song. Where did you find, uh, you know, the music for this movie? Uh, that's one of my favorite things to talk about with respect to this uh, film is the music. Um, a lot of the music comes from this artist, Jason Anderson, who years ago, when I had first started working on the script, I had found his music through a music blog that I loved um, called Fuel Friends, and they played his music and. I reached out to him through his Bandcamp page and I, it was like new to Bandcamp, it was early days and I, I figured that it was gonna be some music label that was just gonna receive this message or it was gonna be some webmaster. And I reached out to him in the middle of the night just being like, I love your music, I'm writing this script that like, I feel like your, your voice, your music is just like the musical form of what I'm writing. And I would love to somehow collaborate with, with this artist. If there's any way to get in touch with him, you can put my, me and get some contact info. And then a couple hours, a couple hours later, excuse me, in the middle of the night, he reaches back to me directly um, and was like, thanks so much for the email. I would love to like collaborate. She sent me the script. It'd be so cool to work on together. And he was just the nicest guy. Just so incredible. And then over the years, we kept in contact. He read the script. He was so excited. I would go see his shows anytime he was playing in Brooklyn. And similar to all the other people that were involved in the film, just like we brought them on early on and thought we were going to make the film earlier. When we finally shot the film, we reached out and said like, Hey, would you still be cool with like collaborating? And he was so excited and he was like, anything you need, any song, let's talk. Um, and that song at the end in the credits is just like a gorgeous, gorgeous stripped down version of one of his other songs. There's like three different versions of that song. There's like a, a full assembly, um, there's just like an acoustic version and there's just like a strip down his voice that it was just like broke my heart hearing that song and uh, just being able to like actually get to work with him after all these years of talking with him was just like a beautiful full circle moment. And uh, some of the other music is like a, a band Fenster who's like a, a, we met them at our friend's wedding in Costa Rica. They all like went to college together and they were so cool. They all live in Germany and we reached out to them saying, is it possible to like, work with your music in the film and they were so awesome. Yeah, um, and then another song Tim. is a friend of ours, Tim Porbet, who I, I worked with in a restaurant years ago and he <laughs> is just like an amazing musician and we needed like one specific um, song for a scene that we were having trouble finding and, um, and just listened to that and reached out to him and he was just like so gracious yeah. and, and generous with it. And it was, yeah, it was just, we got lucky with so many talented friends, just like, um, yeah, that's, offering their talents. That's awesome. I, I love that this, you know, film it feels like a real community effort to, to make and it, it yeah. really yeah. comes through. Yeah. Um, and you know, one thing I want to also say is I thank you so much for at the end in the credits, you put, the, the, the role, the character's name, and the actor, because I cannot tell you how many movies I watch, and I try to go back, and I'm like, oh, I really liked that character, and I look up on their IMDb page, and then I kind of remember the name, and there's no picture, and I'm just trying to struggle to figure out who that was, and I, was, I saw that, I was like, oh, thank God, someone finally <laughs> wrote everything down. I spent days on those credits. It's a thing that, like, most people would not appreciate, but it's just like when people, you're the second person now to comment on the credits and it's just like, maybe that's the most fulfilling comment possible. Cause it's just like, it was exhausting. <laughs> just like the, the timing of each thing was timed in a certain way. And it was just, uh, yeah, thank you. That's, uh, I feel like it was like a fun way to uh, expand upon these roles and like sort of 
give credit to the people that helped us and make it easy for people to know who they were in the in the project. Uh, definitely, it was, it was much appreciated. Uh, so I, I know we've been going for a while. If you've got the time, I'd like to move into, I call it the lightning round. It's just lightweight, short questions about kind of the characters or the film and to see kind of uh, your experiences map on them. But I, I mean, I, we've been going for longer than I, I anticipated just because I, I love talking about this film. So if you've got not there. I, I'm terrible with lightning rounds. So let's, let's try. <laughs> All right. And this is for both of you. You can, you can both answer. Uh, and also if you want to pass, feel free. Uh, you know, I try to keep them very answerable, but I don't, you know, if you don't want to answer one, that's perfectly fine. Um, what is the worst apartment that you've lived in? Oof. I lived in an apartment in Brooklyn. Um, it was the, back sectioned off loft um it was just one room it was a bed a bath it actually had a really cool bathtub um and a toilet all in the same no 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 doors just the hot tub one yeah. yeah it had it had jets in the hot tub but it was um the toilet was just in the open and the couple who owned the place lived in the front half and they would have the most like terrifying horrendous fights I've ever heard in my life and I thought I was going to get murdered by them because they would fight about me living in the back space and I would hear them. Um, yeah, it was a nightmare. Mine was a, a, a small room in a house in Borum Hill in Brooklyn, just like a, a old, old house that uh, just living in a shoebox, nothing like uh, no, no scary roommates. I've had roommates that would like knock on the door in the middle of the night and just like be drunk and whatever, but I think every experience is just like not great in here. True story. Is that is that where the uh, the, the the bathroom as the safe or the bathtub as the safe haven uh, came from, Leah? <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> it wasn't a safe haven though, because it was in the middle of the room. <laughs> just just fill up with water and just hide under and see if see, <laughs> maybe they won't notice you. <laughs> Uh, so what, what is the last thing that someone bought for you? And we'll say not, you know, just from your significant other. Uh, for me, it was, uh, for my birthday, uh, in May, um, it was, I also make Amaro, um, the Italian bitter digestive spirit. Uh, and I was gifted from my family, this like filtration machine that helps like clarify the Amaro. So that was the, the contraption. That was a, a really great gift, a helpful gift mm -hmm. for my side project. The last gift, um, uh, my mom just gave me um, two books. Uh, we were just in Cincinnati visiting. Um, it, one is um, RBG's book and the other one is, I forget what it's Icky called. Guy. It's Icky, yeah. A Japanese self-help book. A Japanese self-help book. <laughs> Perfect. Both, both great answers. And uh, what is the best thing that someone has bought for you that, that has not been from your significant other? The best thing that someone has ever bought for us. Um, my, um, my writing, I have a writing and comedy partner and she just sent us um, two salt and pepper uh, bunny shakers that are like humping each other. <laughs> sure. I really like that. Sure. Yeah, same. Yeah. <laughs> which, which is, oh, which she's, is also the, she's also in the film. Yeah. She's, um, <laughs> yeah, she plays the, um, the barista in the film. Which is the salt and which is the pepper? Uh, I actually <laughs> Mix and match. Maybe, maybe they can rotate. I don't know. We should allow them to each be the top and the bottom. Yeah. I don't know. Can I see them? <laughs> we're, in our, we're not in California right now. Uh, okay. We'll it's, send you a picture. Yeah. <laughs> we're at some of the nether regions, though. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just cut it in right here. Uh, <laughs> what is the uh, What's the first job that you had? Uh, I worked in a video store in Montreal, uh, and. I worked there for one day. Uh, the first half of the day I was training and the second half of the day they thought that I was qualified enough to go work in the porn section in the basement. <laughs> I was not of age, whatever. Uh, and they sent me to the basement and I just had to like be there to receive or like fetch tapes for people. And I was there for three hours down in the basement 
super creepy. Um, this is back in the 90s where there were video stores and uh, at the end of the day, they were like, great, thanks. And then never got, never heard from them again. So I was let go, even though I trained and then they put me in the porn section. So it just felt like a, a really strange tease. So, so you can say that you you've worked porn before. So that's a uh, that's you know one, <laughs> one thing that all actors have to have to come to terms with. So <laughs> yeah, you're gonna splice everything out of this. She's gonna be the humping salt shakers in the porn job. <laughs> I think we've all got a little crazy during quarantine. So <laughs> totally. uh, my first job was at Cold Stone Creamery um, in Cincinnati, and um, but I also quit. I quit after a week. It was a terrible job. Um, I I made my, my my younger brother also worked there, and I made him call on both of our behalfs and say that our um, our grandfather had died, which is a very bad thing to do. Um, and I said he said that we had to move out of the out of <laughs> out of the state. So they knew that we were lying. But. Yeah, but not really much they can say about that. So. <laughs> We kept the shirts. They called and they asked for the shirts back, but we kept them. <laughs> you showed them. Yeah. Um, if you weren't filmmakers or actors, uh, what would you be? I think I've, I've heard a couple options, but uh, what would your what would your passion passion uh, project be? Your passion job, or practical? It could be a practical job. Um, I would be a singer, but I can't sing. <laughs> um. <laughs> I feel like being a, a chef would be, it's, it's not fun, I think, for a lot of people. Um, but I, I really enjoy food and uh, I'd, I'd like to be around food. There you go. but, uh, you've, you've got the experience and, and Leah, just start singing. I mean, this, this you know. You, I you, will. Oh, and <laughs> I will. Let's, <laughs> let's just let's have a rendition of the closing credit scene and start. <laughs> The only song that she does sing on repeat is the closing credit song from the film The Rose, called The Rose, and that's uh, a daily occurrence around the house. It's the best karaoke song of all time. Working on your craft, I love it. Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of heard this. Uh, have you ever wa just walked out on a job? Uh, I guess Cold Stone is kind of kind of like that, but have you ever just like straight up quit uh, on a job and just, just like left? I've done it once. Um, I had a, I worked at. Um, a concert venue where the the um, the managers were just the meanest people I've ever interacted with, and um, it was a Lady Gaga concert, and they like screamed at me for going on the floor at the wrong time, and I just I walked out, and I called David crying, oh. and he picked me up. <laughs> yeah, I've left uh, a bar job once before, just like super obnoxious like the character in the film uh just like so overbearing and it just like had built up and just like i can't do this anymore it's just a poisonous environment and failed both sound like good options i imagine david took you to uh to cold stone after to to milk the the right. wounds of walking out of lady gaga yeah right. sing for me <laughs> sing gaga for My me life forget gaga full circle there we go um have you ever taken a big trip on a whim? A big trip on a whim. I mean, we just drove cross country this week, uh, which wasn't really a whim. We meticulously planned it because of uh, the pandemic. Uh, a big trip on a whim. We, I mean, we went to Spain and France for Leah's birthday. Not like the Brazil trip. Definitely not. I guess I see where the question's coming from now. I see what you're doing. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking. <laughs> uh, Very crafty. Never like in the middle of the night kind of thing. I think that takes like a certain type of access or uh, disposable income to be able to do that that I think we're working towards. But I feel like making the film was metaphorically taking a trip on a whim. Totally. Where we like came to a place to for a short time and then we just stayed and totally that's a good point. Yeah, that, that's a good answer. Yeah, when that that trip happened, my first thought was, "Where's your passport? Is it even like is it even valid? Do we have one?" Yeah. I was just like trying to think of the logistics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
what is the best meal you you've had or made? I think my birthday this year, um, in May, we, all I wanted to do for my birthday, I didn't want to do any of these like zoom birthdays or drive by birthdays or anything that like, this was only like a month and a half into the pandemic and I was already like tired of all these things. Um, I wanted to spend the day cooking and making a variety of things. So we made Montreal bagels, uh, which is a thing if you ever had them. Um, and I'd never made them before. So we like figured out I, for like a week, I researched recipes and then we made this specific type of cake that I had growing up in Montreal that from a restaurant that had closed down. So we figured out that recipe. And then we made handmade pasta, uh, which we do every now and then, but we made like a, a stuffed pasta that we had never done before, like a, a tortelloni pasta that everything was so handmade and thought out. And that was like the best day of food I've ever had, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would second that. That sounds delicious. Um, yeah. uh, and we did it all together actually, which was really great to experience. <laughs> That's awesome, it's a great answer. Um, what is the most impressive piece of art you've ever seen? And living in, or being in, uh, spending time in New York, I imagine there's some good options. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I used to go to, to MoMA a lot, um, and there was like a Jackson Pollock, a massive Jackson Pollock there that, love him or hate him, uh, I loved him, but um, that room, there was like a bench in front of it. And it's just, uh, it was a special place for me in New York. It was one of those, uh, the world shuts down, the world quiets. And you could just like stare at this like mess of a masterpiece. And uh, that I think will always be, because of what it did to me from when I was like struggling in New York, I think that was the most impressive piece that I could ever see. Oh, I know what mine is. Um, so there's a, a, a museum in, a Contemporary Museum in New York, PS1, PS1, mm, yeah, PS1, oh, 20, yeah. PS1 22, or is that the theater? PS1? PS1. PS1. Um, and there was this exhibit, there's this room where you walk in and it's just like blasting, it's an, it looks like Bob an empty Dylan. room, they're blasting Bob Dylan. Positively 4th Street, just the like, woo, the two. <laughs> and the, the like little card, the, the name of the piece is Chicken Burrito, Beef Burrito. And you just walk in and it's just an empty room. And then like on the floor, there's just like two burritos. You don't notice it at first. <laughs> it was just so weird and amazing. It just made us laugh so hard. It was my favorite thing I've ever seen. Yeah, and then you like sit in the room and you watch other people come in, not <laughs> think that like the art piece isn't up yet. And they just walk out and we went back another time and the two burritos were stacked on top of each other they on do. the window sill. They change it every day. <laughs> and it's like, that's <laughs> brilliant. Yeah, so. Yeah, it's art, I guess. Were, were they labeled or were they just two? <laughs> Best, art. Best art I've ever seen. There you go. Yeah. Uh, and finally, what would your imaginary dog's name be? We okay. almost got a dog oh, a yeah. few years ago and we named him or her o Oatmeal. Yeah. So the, the food the food references are, are consistent. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Oats for short. Oats. That's a good name. Yeah. Good dog name. All right. And uh, so the, the movie is out digitally. So, you know, everyone can rent it, buy it, watch it a couple times. It, you're definitely going to want to, if anything, just to hear that credits scene again. I, I listened to it like three or four times this morning as well. Um, uh, thank you so much. What is the what is next for you all? We have a couple, um, I, we're both each working on uh, features that um, are sort of in the, in the pipeline. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I feel like we have a lot of different things that I don't know which one we'll catch next. Yeah, but. we sort of each have like a pilot that we're trying to pitch and a feature that we've been working on. Uh, we're starting to develop ideas to like, the, all of those scripts we sort of worked on on our own with each other's like, guidance and um, angel advice 
but now we're trying to start to find an idea. I think we actually just like came up with an idea this week, uh, another food related film um, that we could maybe work on together that sort of takes place in Leah's hometown of Youngstown, uh, Ohio. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm also working on this Amaro, which is called Tundra Amaro. So I like have a, a YouTube channel where I make fun videos uh, about my documenting my process with making Amaro. So that's like a fun outlet. It's called That's Amaro, um, the channel. Yeah, it's, the videos are amazing and funny and the Amaro is actually very tasty also. So hopefully that will be on the shelf soon. Yeah. Yeah, well, hopefully, we'll, hopefully we'll have shelves soon. It's just, this, this is yeah. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, what a, what a, it's like, not even just the restaurants, but just the shelves. Hopefully yeah, <laughs> just stores will be open and people will be able to go. And yeah, yeah. it's just yeah. weird time. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me. This is, this is a blast. Uh, I love the film, as you could tell, and I love talking about it. Uh, these insights were, were great to hear. And I'm glad to hear that you two are together and became stronger through this uh, stressful but uh you know emotional process we got married, we got married since, after yeah. the film so yeah. that's a that's a good test like it's a good way to temper the relationship and, and make sure you come through yeah really. well awesome thank you so much thank you for having us this was so fun and that's a, uh, a really beautiful review it was yeah. just uh it meant a lot to us to read um your words Oh, thank, thank you so much for saying that because you know I, I write a lot of reviews and then you know, sometimes I don't know if, if people actually like them. So thank you so much. It, uh, it actually means a lot to hear that too. So thank you for, and thank you for the film. I, I really loved it too. Thanks. That was David Bly and Leah Ruddick of Sweet Parents. Sweet Parents is available digitally on pretty much every platform. So you can rent it, buy it, check it out a couple of times. It, it's something that you're going to want to watch. It, it's a really special film. If you like this interview, please like and subscribe to this channel. It helps me out a lot to make sure all my new interviews go straight to you. And if you happen to be a rich benefactor and want to help out a small independent blog, let me know. I could always use the help. Uh, and as always, please go to watcherpass.com for all your movie reviews, interviews, and recommendations. Thank you.